Okay, so if I can have your attention, please. We'd like to oh, yeah. convene back hey, to give out the three career Niagara Career Awards. Hey, hey, Aaron. Someone at Periscope just said hi to you. Someone, uh, I, I didn't catch the name, but someone's saying hi to you on here. Yeah. <laughs> to begin with, I'd like to ask uh, Aaron Fiss to come forward, please. Aaron is the past president and is going to present the Anderson Everett Award. Hello, everybody. Doug. To... Doug. 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 Sorry, Aaron. Sorry, I'm wrong. I'm alive with you, though. Yeah. So I'm here to announce the Anderson Everett Award. This award was first presented in 1979, recognizes important and continued contributions to the association over a period of years. Uh, the award honors the efforts of David Anderson and Margaret Everett for their significant early contributions to the association and the Great Lakes. Shh. You know, as president and past president, the two cool things that I get to do are I got to give Ron Heights an award last year, and, and now I, need, I get to give this award. And it's amazing to me uh, that this year's winner is actually getting this award and has not previously won this award. So the 2017 Anderson Everett Award recipient is Bob Pecky. <laughs> Bob, is, Bob is the uh, McKnight Endowed Presidential Professor Emeritus in the Department of Biology and Large Lakes Observatory at the University of Minnesota Duluth, following an illustrious career that included the University of Waterloo and DFO, and of course, the Experimental Lakes area. His list of awards and accomplishments are remarkable and are inspiring. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He won the Hutchison Medal a long time ago, the Rieger Award. And I can remember as a young PhD student at the Freshwater Institute when I started back in 1994, and I was so intimidated by Bob. But if there's a nicer, more approachable person in science, I don't know who it is. Uh, Bob is a great, great person. Bob's commitment to the Great Lakes is outstanding, not just the Laurentian Great Lakes, it's around the world, and in particular in Africa, he has been the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Great Lakes Research since 2012, and he is doing a remarkable job. The quality of the journal and the respect for the journal, both through Stephanie's work and Bob's work, is, a, is amazing. He's the Canadian Commissioner for the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. His excellence in research related to limnology in the Great Lakes is really uh, hard to find. I must throw us a comment out on the near shore shell hypothesis, which is Bob's idea and really has, in my opinion, driven a lot of the research, important research that's going on in the Great Lakes, or wonderful Great Lakes. Uh, maybe the most important thing that Bob done, has done is his amazing history of mentoring excellent students and postdocs uh, who are driving Great Lakes and Immunology research. So, Join me in congratulating Bob Hecke as the 2017 Anderson Everett Award winner. Jack Valentine Award. Uh, thank you. 
we, you know, I think we all have something, a couple of things in common. One of them is uh, you're sitting at the dinner table with your significant other, and uh, a simple question comes up, and you begin to uh, explain in great detail the, you know, the stoichiometry of stable isotopes or the top-down, you know, bottom-up hypothesis, and you go on, and eventually, uh, you know, your significant other's eyes glaze over and says something to the effect like, "Don't be such a scientist." You know, I think they even look like that. I'm sure that's happened at all our dinner table, May, except maybe Bob and Stephanie's table. That probably doesn't happen. <laughs> the other thing I think we probably all have in common is you've, you've uh, been interviewed by the media, for example. Uh, when the press comes in, they ask you a, a relatively simple question, and again, you launch into a very long-winded uh, and explicit uh, description or answer of the question, and then you say something like, you know, and then the blood sucking, you know, lamprey eels, and that's the thing that gets quoted, of course. <laughs> Nothing about it. And I heard a great quote yesterday, actually. Uh, it said, some, some problems, some problems are so complicated that you have to be very intelligent and extremely well informed to be undecided about them. And in fact, our, our recipient this year of the Jack Valentine Award is exactly that kind of person. Highly intelligent and very well informed, and does what we scientists have a very difficult time doing, and that is communicating our science to the public. So it's really my pleasure and privilege to uh, announce this year's winner of the Jack Valentine Award for Great Lakes Communication to uh, Milwaukee's own Dan Egan. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, this is an intimidating crowd for me because I'm not a scientist. I have a, uh, a degree in history, um, but I, I work with scientists and I rely on them entirely. And a lot of people in this room and at this conference have helped me along the way. And I'm just happy that they're willing to share their time with me so I can help tell the public the story of the Great Lakes because we all need the public to understand what's going on and what needs to be done to um, to protect and to, to, to keep the lakes from slipping backwards, which they may be in danger of doing if, if things keep heading in the direction they are politically. So I'll leave it at that, but I, 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 I could not do this job without the patience of so many of the Great Lakes scientists walking me through things because uh, I, I'm an idiot, but I, I write for idiots, so <laughs> not idiots, but I'm a common person. Anyway, thank you. It's available on Amazon.com. The death of the right to the great life, Danny and the author. Drysidid muscles. 
His work and coverage changed the way we view unintentional introductions. His influence is inescapable at Niagara meetings. His published work is cited repeatedly during talks involving Dreisinid muscles and their influence on the lakes. His almost 50 year long and extremely distinguished career in Great Lakes Ecology is very diverse and includes the study of long-term trends in benthic communities, the role of benthic invertebrates in the cycling of contaminants and nutrients, and trophic interactions between benthic communities and the upper food web. In particular, this individual is known for their key contributions to document the spread of dreissenid mussels throughout the Great Lakes, to document the decline of diphoria throughout the lake, and exploring the causes and consequences of these changes. I'll also note that this guy is a super nice guy. As one of the letter writers pointed out, he's an amazingly humble man who always listens and is very attentive to others. He's a, he's a respected and trusted representative of the Great Lakes science community. He's an ambassador for the lakes. He works easily with people from many backgrounds, has an incredibly approachable nature, excellent mentor, he's enthusiastic, energetic, and one of my favorites, he's the godfather of diaper eye research. So if you haven't guessed already, it's my great pleasure to present Tom Nalepa for his, as a foundation of a loving member of the Great Lakes community and who is entirely and truly deserving of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Tom. say that when I look back at my career, I really wasn't aware that I was achieving anything, really. Uh, I was concerned with asking the right questions and uh, doing good science uh, to answer those questions. I think first, most of all, I wanted to uh, uh, 
be present something or leave behind something that was informative and useful for others to build on. And I think with, also with looking back at my career, um, there were some remarkable events that occurred. Uh, I think it's one time events that occur only once in, in, in the course of your, your, your career. And for the most part, I was just being in the right place at the right time and um, having the resources to take advantage of that opportunity. I think in other cases, uh, I was in the right place at the wrong time. In the case of that was when I, that's when I really started studying the benthos in the first place. Uh, when I started at EPA uh, with my uh, first career job, I was fresh out of Michigan State where I studied the zooplankton in the Western Lake Erie. Yeah! But soon after, um, you know, within a few months of um, starting at EPA, I got married and uh, uh, when I got back from my honeymoon, uh, I stopped into the office um, to check on things and say hi to everybody. And uh, when I got back, I remember it was on a Thursday, uh, they told me, uh, you're going to catch a ship um, uh, to Lake Ont or gonna catch a flight to Lake Ontario on that Monday to help sample the benthos of Lake Ontario. And uh, uh, this was in for the IFUBA project back in 1972. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that's quite something. And I found out later that uh, no one else wanted to sample Lake Ontario for a week in November. And since I was the I was the newcomer, uh, newcomer and gone at the time the request sampling request came in, I was the chosen guy. And uh, you know, besides the fact that I was uh, uh, seasick for just about that whole week, uh, it turned out okay because my first scientific talk and my first scientific paper was about the benefits of Lake Ontario. Um, so when I think back um, on that first trip after our honeymoon and uh, all the subsequent sampling trips that I went on, uh, sometimes pretty extended, I gotta give my first special thank you to my wife, uh, Sherry, who uh, put up with me gone, being gone all the time. So she's really a partner in any, any of the successes that I've had, really. EPA and started at NOAA, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. I initially did some zooplankton work and Hank over there could attest to that. And um, But that sampling trip, that first sampling trip to Lake Ontario really made an impression on me and I couldn't get out of my mind uh, some of the changes that were happening and I really wanted to start linking environmental change to some of the uh, benefit community changes. So, and uh, somehow the appeal of studying changes over the long term was really very compelling. I, I like the idea of uh, linking the present to the past and, and leaving something for the future, something to build on for the future for all those that came after me. And frankly, I was uh, really frustrated by that Lake Ontario paper that I was writing because I had a, a good set of data to explain the spatial changes but I had no long-term data to which to compare if what I was seeing uh, was within the realm, within the range of what might be expected. So I was determined then to, to set out with the goal of looking at long-term change. And I gotta thank Andy Robertson, who was our group head at the time, who helped me crystallize some of those ideas. Um, we hit upon uh, southern basin of Lake Michigan uh, because there was some good 60s data collected at the time, and uh, our ship was completely located in Grand Haven. But of course, the question at the time was, okay, uh, this is the clicker. Um, so the question to ask at the time was whether the Bethos was declining in response to phosphorus control measures. This was in the late 1990s. We knew that they had increased as a, res as a result of increased enrichment and increase in algal productivity, 
would they decline, available productivity decline? And that, in planning that first Southern Basin survey, it took me to Al Beaton. And uh, I first met Al uh, when he was the director of the uh, center, uh, well, let's see, the, the Great Lakes uh, and Marine Water Center at the University of Michigan. And I walked into his office and, uh, with the intention of him ask, asking him for all his 1960s data that was an original and, and had never been published. And I really don't, didn't know what to expect, but Al graciously provided all that data and he threw in, uh, as a bonus, some data that he had collected for Saginaw Bay. And that, I, I thought that was really important because we started sampling Saginaw Bay in the late 1980s. But uh, I expected to, to, to take a look at the data, maybe get copies of it and leave. But boy, Al, uh, we talked for I don't know how long you know, about the value of long-term data sets and historic data. And I remember leaving his office so, so very char charged up and determined to do that first Southern Basin survey. And, uh, and, and, and so, Right after that survey, this was back in 1980, we continued on doing these surveys. And really, all the people here that helped with the program, uh, I, I'm immensely grateful to, to everybody on that list. I'm sure I'm missing somebody, uh, but they are the, the people that made the, the greatest contribution, uh, both going in the field and doing collections, uh, under some pretty rough conditions at times, and all, oh, and spending some long, tedious hours under the microscope. Uh, I'm certainly grateful, uh, and uh, I really, uh, there's more people on this list. There's summer fellows and volunteers and, and so many other people that lend a hand, a hand in it all, but uh, these are the people I remember and uh, that stayed the longest and uh, contributed both in the field and in the laboratory. So I, I you know, I, I really share this award with all of you, you know, and uh, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> of course, you know, I think all my, thank all my, uh, my co-authors. Uh, I'm grateful to, to be on the papers that you published, and thanks for the input of uh, the papers that I published. And I also got a, a, you know, when you do big surveys like this, uh, well, I, I also threw in Greg Lane uh, because he never, he never picked a sample or went out on the boat, but he's the one that generated, he took the data and he generated all those blue figures. And, it, and to me, it made the, the data come alive and, and really illustrate some of the dramatic changes that we were seeing. So thanks to Greg. Um, and when you do big, surveys on these big lakes you need big ships. So I thank the crews of the Lake Guardian uh, and uh, Glenn Paul for providing the ship and, and for the Limnos and Environmental Canada at the time for providing, providing the Limnos. But I, I gotta thank especially the crew of the Lorentia because uh, they were so supportive in all these sampling periods and, uh, and understanding what I always, always would say Let's see if we can take one more sample. Can we get another sample in? And, and they were so understanding and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, supportive throughout those many years of sampling. And when, when I was doing small boat work, uh, more often than not, it was my, with my friend and colleague from the USGS, Don Slusher. Um, we co-authored a number of papers together, uh, co-edited two books together. And I always found Don a great person to bounce ideas off of. He always kind of thought of, or still does, think outside the box and, and so can ask some pretty probing questions uh, and make you take a different perspective of things. We spent many long days on the water uh, talking about zebra mussels and hexagenia and, and unionids. And so, you know, he has been a, a, a real real colleague and friend all these years. And when you look at this picture, uh, those pictures on the, on, the, on the right, and you look at the middle one, and you look at the guy in the middle who's right there, Ron Griffiths, 
Uh, I got a credit, Ron, with providing the career moment that uh, is kind of lodged in the back of my memory brain forever and ever. Um, Ron convened the first Zebra Muscle Workshop. This was in London, Ontario in, in 1989. And uh, there were 12 of us, and we sat around the table all day talking about biology of zebra mussels and uh, what impacts they were seeing. Mostly at that point were in the, the water intakes and, and some of the potential ecological impacts that may happen. And uh, it really didn't home to me until Ron showed a video of all those mussels that had colonized the neutral waters of Lake Erie on, on all the rocks and all the pilings and all the jetties. And that was my moment, what they call moment of zen. I sat up and I said, things are gonna change forever here. I didn't know at the time how, they were, how big the change was gonna be, but I know something was happening. And I went back to the lab and uh, I, I just said to myself, I gotta do something. I gotta start documenting this. And, you know, that was a typical example of me being at the right place at the right time. And, and just a year later, we, the lab got a huge amount of uh, resources to, uh, uh, to do zebra mussel research. So the, the resources became in place and we were on our way to, to looking at the, the impacts. Um, and I was sitting in uh, oh, I, another thing I want to do is I want, really want to thank Don, Don uh, Scabia and Jen Reed at the University of Michigan. Because when I retired from NOAA, they provided a position in which I was able to uh, finish a number of projects. And I think important for me was to uh, become part of a teaching team uh, to, to perhaps share some of my information and help shape the future generations of uh, Great Lakes science and managers. And boys, <laughs> I've stared at a couple of the students right here that took the course. Uh, that, that's great. And uh, so, you know, when I was uh, at the zebra muscle uh, or the dry senior session yesterday, I uh, saw this graph that, that Ashley presented and I started thinking back and, 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 and said to myself, yeah, perhaps I did leave a little something behind that I was going to build on. And uh, that was pretty gratifying. And I'm grateful to Ashley for carrying on that work and uh, to poor Plural to support the work. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm saving my last thank you for all of you, members of the Great Lakes community and IAGRA. Uh, you've been a constant source of uh, motivation and inspiration. So uh, I, I, I thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart.
a sense of, of what we can do to affect the future of Great Lakes research. And, and I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to go and check out the letter that we wrote to uh, the Trump and Trudeau. We invited them to come today. I don't think they're here. I haven't been on the whole boat, so they might be hiding somewhere, but I don't think they showed up or responded to the letter. Um, anyway, um, so thanks for a great meeting. Uh, I'd like to ask Aaron Dunlop to come up and uh, close out the meeting because she is now the new president. I'm going to go have a beer. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank Thomas for his service uh, to Iagra as president over the past year. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close the banquet and say, see everybody in Scarborough, uh, University of Toronto, Scarborough, next year. Yeah.